Hi everyone, my name is Kate Richardson. I'm the staff attorney and pro bono manager at Swords to Plowshares. And this is Mo Sidor, the pro bono fellow at Swords. So thank you all so much for volunteering with us at the 2014 East Bay Stand Down this Friday and Saturday. We're really looking forward to what is sure to be a really powerful event. This brief training will provide a brief refresher for some of the key points that you'll be covering when meeting with veterans this weekend. So at the stand down, we'll be giving limited scope legal advice and assistance on VA service connected benefits, non-service connected pension, and discharge upgrades. So these are the same services that we provide at our legal clinics. So if you've staffed a legal clinic with us in the past, you're in good shape. If you haven't, don't worry. You'll have all the training you'll need before your shift starts. So again, this is a refresher training and you should have completed a live training with us at this point at your firm. If you have not, um, we ask that you complete hours one, two, and three of our online PLI training available to you for free. Um, that link went out in the email that you received on Monday. And we also ask that everyone who has not yet watched hours five and six of that PLI training on discharge upgrades to please do so at any time before your shift on Friday or Saturday. Before we dive in, just a few logistical concerns. So your shifts are broken out on Friday and Saturday, the 12th and 13th, from 9.30 to 1 and 12.30 to 4. The East Bay Stand Down is occurring again at the Alameda County Fairgrounds. Um, so please take into account travel time and, and leave yourselves enough time to get there. When you arrive, you'll go straight to the community services tent after you check in. And you can tell any volunteer coordinators that you're with Swords to Plowshares legal team. Now again, we're at the community services tent, not the legal tent. Um, we'll be giving limited scope advice and assistance as we do at our legal clinics on VA benefits and discharge upgrade applications. We'll have some law students there doing an initial screen and then you're likely to meet with a veteran in pairs and there will be at least two Swords to Plowshares staff attorneys there at all times um, for whenever questions that you might have arise. So before we get into it, I just wanted to give a brief overview about what stand downs are um, and sort of the background of stand downs. So you'll see this quote from the VHA and stand down literally means um, to sort of put your weapons, put your equipment down, come in and get some rest and recuperate. Uh, since the first stand down was held in Chicago, or excuse me, in San Diego in 1988, stand downs have taken place in over 200 cities nationwide. The first East Bay stand down was held in 1999, so there's quite a significant, significant history there as well. Um, and there's a stand down almost every week somewhere across the country. Services typically provided at a stand down include everything from shelters to meals to personal care. Um, there's haircuts, there's clothing, there's health care services, mental health counseling, spiritual services, and of course legal services. So on that note, I just want to remind volunteers that Swords to Plowshares offers a range of services as well. Um, we have permanent and supportive housing, transitional housing, we have our Institute for Veteran Policy, we have health and social services, so full-time social workers on staff, employment and job training, and then of course our legal department. And so I just say this to make sure that, you know, encourage veterans at the stand down to connect with SWORDS if they haven't already, um, and make sure they understand it's a resource in, in their community that they can use uh, well after stand down is over. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mo to discuss VA benefits and basic eligibility. Thanks, Kate. The Veterans Administration includes three branches. They provide integrated health care services through the Veterans Health Administration. They provide cash benefits and other financial assistance to veterans through the Veterans Benefits Administration. And lastly, they provide cemetery and memorial services. For our purposes, the stand-down clients will likely be seeking eligibility for VA benefits so that they can start receiving health care and cash, cash benefits from the VA or they will already be receiving VA benefits and they'll need our assistance with filing new benefits claims or for asking for increases in the benefits that they already receive. Not all of those who served in the military are eligible to receive these benefits from the VA. To receive VA benefits, you must have veteran status from the VA, or in other words, the VA must consider you a veteran. As a reminder, um, of those the VA will consider having veteran status, it includes first, those, must, those who have served in any of the five branches of the military, or if the person was a member of the National Guard, they must have been called for federal service. This means that if the President mobilized the National Guard, those service members would have qualifying federal service, 
but if they were only ever called to duty by a state governor, that would not qualify them for VA benefits. Second, the veteran must have served on active duty. For those who served in the reserves, this means that they would have needed to have been mobilized in order to be eligible. Third, they must have served at least two years or for the full time ordered to active duty. For example, if the person was a member of the reserves and they were asked to de deploy for nine months and they completed that nine month stint, then they would have qualified since they have completed their full time order to active duty. Note that there is an exception to this rule. There is no minimum time requirement to receive benefits for service connected disabilities. So another example, if a few months into uh, a person's four year enlistment, they were injured and discharged from the service, they may still be eligible for benefits related to that in service injury. And lastly, the veteran must have honorable service. The statute says that the term veteran means a person who has served in the active military, naval, or air service and who was discharged or released therefrom under conditions other than dishonorable. Determining whether someone was discharged uh, in, a, in a situation other than dishonorable is not as simple as it sounds. The requirement that the veteran discharge under conditions other than dishonorable does not mean that they must have discharged with an honorable discharge status. You'll see here that there are many types of military discharges that a veteran can leave the service with. For the purpose of VA benefits eligibility, those who discharge with honorable, general, or uncharacterized discharge statuses will automatically be considered to have served honorably for VA purposes. For those who discharge with other than honorable status, the VA gets to decide whether they are eligible for VA benefits through a process called character of discharge determination, which we'll discuss in detail in a minute. At Stand Down, we will likely meet a lot of veterans who have other than honorable discharge statuses. Essentially, the VA will look at that veteran service record, medical records, and other relevant evidence and decide on a whole whether the veteran's service was honorable for the purposes of VA benefits. So how do you determine a veteran's discharge status? Well, almost all veterans you work with at Stand Down will know what their discharge status was and be able to tell you, but it's officially documented on their DD-214. This is the discharge document every service member is given when they separate from the service, and it includes informa information such as their branch, the dates and length of their service, their MOS or their job in the military, whether they served in combat, any awards they received, and of course their discharge status. In determining a vet's eligibility for VA benefits, the information on their DD-214 can be very helpful. When advising clients with other than honorable discharges at stand down, it's important to know what the VA will look for in making their determination of whether the veteran's service will be deemed honorable for VA eligibility purposes. To begin, there can be no statutory bars that preclude the VA from providing the veteran benefits. For example, the veteran myth must not have been AWOL for more than 180 days. Note though that this is not a hard and fast rule and if mitigating circumstances can explain the lengthy absence, the veteran may still be eligible. Other bars include that if the, vet if the veteran was discharged as part of their punishment in a general court martial or discharged in lieu of a general court martial, if they were an officer that resigned for the good of the service or if they were a deserter. In those instances, the veteran will have to seek a full discharge upgrade from the Department of Defense in order to, be, um, in order to receive VA benefits. Next, the other than honorable dis discharge must not have been the result of willful and persistent misconduct. Or in other words, there shouldn't be a pattern of misconduct in the, in the service member's record. Nor should it be the result of an offense of moral turpitude this will prevent eligibility, especially if it's coupled with a felony convic conviction. The VA will also consider the quality and length of service and any mitigating factors. For example, if the misconduct was a result of symptoms related to PTSD, or if there was a family emergency that required the veteran to go AWOL. 
The decision about uh, character of discharge determinations is made by the VBA at the regional office level, and it's easier to get than a it's easier to get a favorable character of discharge determination than it is to get a discharge upgrade through the Department of Defense. When a veteran with an other than honorable discharge applies for VA health care or benefits, the VA automatically requests a character of discharge determination for the veteran. There is no application or, or form to request a determination. The veteran needs only to apply for whatever benefit that they seek from the VA, and the VA will automatically start the determination process on their own. The vet should provide the VA with all relevant evidence that will show that their service was honorable, including any military and medical records and support letters from buddies in the service and their friends and family. Note, though, that the VA is not concerned with post-service conduct and will only consider in-service conduct when making their determination. And if a vet is denied VA benefits at this level, they can appeal that decision. If they are approved for benefits, though, this will not change their actual discharge status on their DD-214 or other military documents, but it will make them eligible for all VA benefits except for the GI Bill, which requires an honorable discharge. I'm now going to turn it over to Kate to review service-connected compensation. Great. Thanks, Mo. So, service-connected disability compensation. So once you've sort of overcome that first hurdle and, and shown the VA that you are to be considered a veteran, um, then we look to the three elements of service connection. So service connect, excuse me, service connected compensation is a monthly benefit, just a reminder that it's a monthly benefit, tax-free payments to veterans who have current physical or mental health conditions that are shown to be linked to their military service. So once we're, we're through the door, the first hurdle with the character of discharge determination, if applicable, then we move on to proving all three elements. So a current disability, an in-service event or diagnosis, and then a nexus, that that current disability is in fact as likely as not related to the, time in serv to the event in service. At which point the VA then assigns a rating uh, based on a percentage. This can be temporary or permanent. Um, there's other supplements including individual unemployability that may arise. You might remember that from the training. We will be there to advise you on those sorts of more technical issues. Um, but the, keep in mind this is not means tested. It is not offset by other income. So getting into the elements again, just a quick recap and review. So you have your current disability. The veteran has to have a current physical or mental health condition. And then that in-service event or injury, there has to be some incident in service that caused the condition. Or a condition could have first, made, um, first manifested during service, or that condition was aggravated during service. So incidences can be almost anything, as long as the veteran was on active duty. So it doesn't have to be in combat. This could be, you know, they were, they were playing a game of football while on duty, and any injury that resulted from that will be compensable. The nexus element um, is just, just speaks to the fact that there has to be a link between that current condition and the in-service incident or initial manifestation of the condition. And I will get into the five different theories of nexus because that might be, typically a lot of these claims will turn on nexus and it's good to be able to advise the veteran um, on what uh, theory of nexus they'll be able to, to be most successful under. So the veteran must prove that there's a nexus, again, between the current disability and the in-service incident. This usually requires a positive linkage opinion from a competent medical professional that has reviewed the veteran's military and civilian records and can say, in the standard, keep in mind that very low standard, the benefit of the doubt, so it's 38 U.S.C. 5107B, and that applies to all factual findings, so it's just as likely as not. Tie goes to the runner, the runner's of the veteran, so keep that in mind. It's a really low standard. Um, and what they're looking for here is, you know, if the veteran is claiming, say, for a knee injury that he or she incurred during combat, the VA needs to know that that knee injury that they're currently experiencing is in fact related to that time in service. They want to be sure that, hey, you got in a car accident last year and that's what this knee injury is really about. And so to do that, you can use a few different theories. The one I just described, so we have direct service connection, where you actually have, it's, it's obviously directly related to service. You have aggravation, so the condition was made worse during service. Maybe you had a pre-existing knee condition, but it was made worse during service. Or secondary service connection, which means, you know, you've had a knee injury from service, as a result of, of 30 years of limping on that knee, you now have a hip condition that a, a doctor confirms 
is as likely as not related to your knee condition, well then that hip condition can then become service connected under secondary service connect connection theory. There's also presumptive service connection. We typically see this in Agent Orange exposure cases. And there's VA medical care. So if, if the VA's negligent medical care resulted in an injury, that's another um, theory of, of service connection. A brief overview of procedure. What we're typically to see at the stand down are the first four. So we'll see potentially original claims um, people that have never really filed and we're doing an initial assessment of eligibility and advising them on what they might be eligible for. Supplementary claims, they can always file something new just because they filed the knee condition two years ago does not mean they're um, prohibited from filing a PTSD claim today. Same reopened, if a PTSD claim was denied in the past, um, we can definitely resubmit a claim for PTSD so long as there is new and material evidence that's speaks to the reason why their PTSD claim was denied. So if they were denied on the theory that they could not verify that the in-service stressor occurred, well then the new evidence that you submit has to speak to that. Now keep in mind, as a reminder, that evidence, that bar is very low. So even if that's just a new stressor statement from the veteran discussing the in-service event that occurred um, that triggered the PTSD, that is sufficient to, to reopen a claim. Um, also, a veteran can always file a rating increase if they feel a condition has, has worsened, if they're 30% connected for their PTSD and they've been struggling as of late and feel that a, an increased rating is warranted, we can definitely request that. Clear and unmistakable error is rare. This is a dispositive legal error. Um, if you feel like you are seeing this at Stand Down, please come in and find one of the Swords to Posture staff attorneys and we can, we can discuss it with you. Very briefly, um, Procedure overview, we're going to have an informal claim it is typically how we start a claim and that's what establishes the effective date. We do that on a VA form 214138. We will have all of these forms with us and can walk you through them. Um, it's a very simple statement. This is an informal claim for service-connected disability compensation. If we do that, the veteran has one year from the date we file that to um, submit their formal claim. Now some veterans may wish to file a fully developed claim there with us. We can certainly do that as well. The next stage, just so you're aware and can counsel the veteran on this, you know, the VA will schedule a compensation and pension exam at some point after the formal claim is filed. We have self-help materials on that and we will be passing out a packet of relevant forms and self-help materials to the veterans. So there's a specific, um, there's this specific material on compensation and pension exams. At that point, the VA's decision will come out and there's one year from the date of that decision that you can appeal. Um, we will have that relevant form there too. And just as a reminder, it then goes on to the Board of Veterans Appeals, the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, the Federal, Federal Circuit, and finally, Supreme Court. So moving on to logistics of how we're actually going to be submitting these claims at Stand Down. Um, as most of you know, claims are submitted to the Oakland Regional Office. We will be doing this for the veterans back at our office afterward, and we'll mail them date stamped copies, much like we do at our clinic. If the veteran prefers to take the document with him or herself and file it personally, they are, of course, welcome to do that. Um, but if they want us to, we'd be more than happy to come back and file that and mail them date stamped copies. So the informal claim, again, that just looks like the, the VA Form 214138, stating what they're applying for. It should specify either service-connected compensation or pension, or both. Um, a formal claim is a different form, the 21526 easy. You have the claim form, any relevant evidence you'd like to submit, and then if represented, obviously we usually have an attorney letter as to why those benefits should be granted, and the veteran can always request a hearing. So gathering supportive evidence, what, is, what does this look like when we're advising veterans at the stand-down? We're going to be helping veterans both request their service personnel records as well as their service medical records using the standard Form 180. Um, we will also be helping them request if they filed a claim in the past, it's always a good idea to request their claims file. Um, at that point, the VA has pulled some, some relevant evidence on them and, and gathered together some of their relevant records, and we'd want to see that. So they can request their claims file on the VA Form 3288. Um, there's a separate form for post-service medical records. At the VA, it's Form 10-5345. Um, and then if they're doing a discharge upgrade or character of discharge determination, we'd certainly want to request any trial records or, or relevant court martial records. Um, the other major part of the evidence is statements from the veteran, him or herself, statements from family, friends, community members, 
Um, these are in their own words. We have a self-help material on this that will be in that packet as well. It's not an affidavit, um, and you can kind of talk through one of the, what are the beneficial um, facts to, to make sure that the veteran puts in those statements. I'm going to turn it back over to Mo briefly for non-service connected pension. Thanks, Kate. Non-service connected pension is a monthly benefit for low income wartime veterans who are totally and permanently disabled or who are elderly over the age of 65. Unlike service connected compensation, which Kate just covered, the disabilities for pension do not need to be service connected. To receive a pension, the veteran must be eligible for VA benefits. They must have served at least 90 days and at least one day during designated wartime period, which we'll review in a minute. And if they served after September 1st, 1980, they must meet the minimum length of service requirement. Now, pension is a means-tested benefit, so the amount the veteran will receive each month is offset by other income that they receive. For a single veteran with no dependents, their income must fall below $1,054 a month. Like compensation, the pension payments come monthly and are tax-free, and the VA will consider the veteran's assets in their calculation. The veteran should have approximately under $80,000 worth of assets. Now here's the breakdown of when Congress has declared a period of war. Uh, we'll have this chart at stand down, so there's no need to memorize it, but it's good to be aware that those who served after May 1975, but before August 1990, will not be eligible for pension. So lastly, I just want to do a brief comparison of the service-connected compensation that Kate talked about and this non-service-connected pension benefit. So for service-connected compensation, the veteran's physical or mental health condition must be related to their military service. Whereas with non-service connected pension, the mental health or physical condition does not need to be related to their service. For compensation, the veteran can be service connected for any condition, whether minimal or severe. Um, and again, those ratings go in 10% increments. For pension, the benefit is only available to totally disabled veterans who are unable to work or to veterans over, who are 65 or older. For compensation, the veteran's current income and assets are irrelevant, but for pension, it is a means-tested benefit, so the veteran must be low income and have few assets. For compensation, the veteran can be compensated for injuries that occurred at any time whether they, um, while they were on active duty, but there is no wartime requirement. But of course, with pension, there is the minimum time uh, service length requirement, and they must have served at least one day during the designated period of war. Lastly, for compensation, the total monthly benefits range from $0 to $2,858 for a single veteran with no dependents, whereas with pension, the total monthly benefit that a single veteran with no dependents can receive is $1,054. Great, thanks Mo. So just a reminder again to please watch hours five and six on discharge upgrades and that's available online um, at the, the link that's shown here. We've also emailed that out to you on Monday. Um, so please watch that before your shift. And we just wanna thank you again for volunteering with us for the stand down, we're really looking forward to it. If any questions come up before, um, I've listed both Mo and I's cell phone on the email that went out on Monday. So please feel free to contact us at any time with questions and we look forward to seeing you on Friday and Saturday.